Welcome to the Fantasy Golf Bag Podcast, presented by FantasyGolfBag.com, your number one source for the most in-depth PGA Tour analysis in the daily fantasy and sports betting world. Each week, our experts will discuss everything you need to know, from the course preview and key stats, to top plays, fades, and strategies. Whether golf betting, grinding out cash games, or playing for a big GPP win, our team has you covered. Let's get after it. Welcome back to the Fantasy Golf Bag Podcast. I'm your host, Red Kachik, joined today by Fantasy Jesus, aka Axis, to talk a little RBC Heritage. We had a fun uh, weekend dealing with Tiger's fifth green jacket, 15th major. Um, I mean, it's, it was pretty exciting access. I think, uh, I think he might be able to complete like an actual grand slam this year. If I want to be so like, uh, I wouldn't say I'm a fanboy, but we'll, we'll just say the majors he's about to go play the next, the rest of the year are ones he's won handedly for the most part, besides the British. So, uh, I, I was pretty impressed, man. I think he can do it. Absolutely. Um, I'm still on cloud nine from it. You know, I was like 12 to 16 years old during his heyday. And I'm one of those who really got into golf because of it. Um, it was great to see. It cost me, probably cost me a lot of money since I had Xander and Brooks tickets (laughs) as well. But, uh, if anybody was going to spike them, I'm glad it, I'm glad it was Tiger. I'm glad he got the monkey off his back. Everybody questioning if he was one of the, you know, if he could ever do it again, if he could ever even attempt to chase down Jack. So it adds a lot of storylines. I think it's outstanding for golf. Um, like I, said, I, I loved every second of it, and I was rooting for him. I had a little side action on him, but, uh, it, yeah, I don't really have much to say about it. It was just it was awesome to watch as, as a young, young kid growing up watching it. And the, the injury after injury, you know, watching him keel over after swinging, it uh, – it, it was surreal almost, and then watching him hug his kids at the end, like you just knew, like it meant so much to him too, like the old robotic tiger. Um, it was nice to see the emotion, and yeah, yeah, he's a, he, he's definitely a different type of uh, like player fan relationships now. Like he just yeah, seems and- more lively and smiley, which is great. I think that's a, a big part of how people have like received him over the last year and during this comeback. Yeah, and it was cool to see it because actually during the round you didn't like you did see the old as close as you're gonna get anyway the old like yeah you know there's those pictures on Twitter of like he's standing in Molinari's sight that just bright red shirt love and, it yeah and he's on the twelfth green just standing there like yep hey fuck ups like go hit this go hit this layup yeah. again from the water <laughs> like and I'm right in your field of vision and I'm in the smart I'm in the smart place to be you know I'm gonna two putt and I'm gonna gain two strokes and like. Like the old tight and the face on sixteen, like it, it was, it was there. And then to see it break though when he won was awesome. I think it's uh, I mean everyone watches the the final round, him coming up eighteen and making the putt, and he's all excited. But like for him to have the patience of mind and like the or the presence of mind, I guess, to be going through that back nine and finally like, like I mean he's he's arguably the greatest player that's ever lived and honestly jack has more majors than him but like what we've seen from tiger is probably something we would never see again but like you have to imagine at some point if if this was any normal person you're like wow i'm this is a huge comeback like i'm actually nervous right now i'm about to do it i you know don't screw up right now but no he was just like nope i'm the greatest that's ever lived i'm gonna keep trucking these guys can't beat me done yeah and I, I don't think he gets appreciation for that because he, mentally man there's a lot more behind the scenes going on to like you know put your keep yourself in the moment because he's gonna he, i guarantee you he's walking up some of those holes thinking man people are gonna love me i'm the greatest people are gonna praise me again and he has to just stay in the moment and finish out the tournament like that's so tough to do in the moment I assume it helped again. I can never imagine what it's like in his head, but I assume it helped last year's open um, getting in contention there. I assume the PGA was a nice mental hurdle. Like, okay, yeah. I finished second. Like he wasn't really in it just cause Brooks was dominating, but you know, I'm there. And then 
obviously the win at East Lake, like all those guys at East Lake are were in this field, another smaller field, but like I've beaten them all before. I know I played with Rory on Sunday. I know I can do it. Like, and he let Molinari crack. Like Molinari was seemed unfazed. I mean, you could he hit some wayward shots on the front nine, but for the most, you know, he kept getting up and down and. Tiger really wasn't gaining too much ground, and he he let them break on a course that he knows better than any of them. And yeah, it was just it was just awesome. Like yeah. it just yeah, we could decipher that whole round because I mean it was so many ups and downs and turning points, especially in the back nine. It was just unreal. Yeah, unreal. Was, like I was so impressed with Molinar. Even like you're like, oh, here's a chance. Like he's wayward off the tee, or he over he overshot this green by a ton and then just chips it up to three feet and drains it. And it's like, holy crap. Like, yeah, Molinari's pretty nails too. Like, uh, and yeah. It is, and he you, doesn't have a demeanor. Like at 12, you're just like, Oh, how do you do that? Like, have these people not seen the videos and the stories and yeah. the, like, like, holy crap. And then, yeah, to watch Brooks do it even. And I think Poulter did it. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like, and I had money on Brooks. It's like, what are you like? watch a video you don't like well i have uh, i got a bit a bigger appreciation for that whole after going last week um we went on the practice round for wednesday and uh, a buddy was there we, we saw at the gift shop and uh he was like go straight to amen corner this was really early in the morning he's like get there before a lot of people are there just to like experience it with less people because obviously there's a hundred thousand yeah. people total and a, a lot of them you know congregate right there it's it's not the funnest spot um but like we were sitting up just just above the or behind the tee and kind of near the chipping area of 11 um and you could feel the wind coming through the trees but the flag on 11 and on 12 green wasn't moving and i was like this is why guys have trouble because they're probably down there the flags aren't moving they can't feel anything down at the you know where the tee box is with all those people around grandstands behind them so it, it, i mean that's why you I see guys was- when it gets windy, they'll fly to that back bunker in the flower bed almost, or they'll come up short because, like, I, I don't think they know where the wind's blowing and it swirls around. It's a, uh, it's actually it was- so much tougher than what it seems like. I think on TV, way tougher than, in my opinion, I think it's way tougher holding 17 at Sawgrass being an island green. I, it's 12 is nothing like that. It's way more difficult. Yeah, I think it was Jack. I think I'd, I, I'd love to quote where I read it from, but it was, uh, I think he said he aimed for the middle of the green between the two bunkers on the left, no matter where the flag was on that hole. Like, that's probably smart, man. Play like, that hole even a, far for the week. That's not a hole to, yeah, this isn't where you're going to make, like, just, this isn't where you need to go for birdie. I mean, I guess, I guess if you're down like six, sure, go with the flag. But, you know, Sunday Masters final two groups, like, that's not where you, that's not where you're trying to make up a stroke. And and Tiger ended up, he did par, and he made up two strokes because of it. So Yeah, I think maybe it's just a mental thing. Like, it's such a short hole from, a, like, a, a yard standpoint. Yeah, Those guys, feet. yeah, um, so guys are hitting a nine iron. Brooks probably hit a nine iron, and, like, I need to go at the flag with a nine iron. And Tiger's like, no, just didn't- don't go at the pin, man. Yeah, it, it was awesome. It'll be great. Um I mean, now you got the the chase for 18. Uh, he's probably got a couple of years for that, I'd imagine. So, like you said, he's coming up to courses he's won at. Uh, yeah, I, I'm ready for he's it. He's already the favorite at every major now. Like, it's not even bettable at this point. He's like seven and a half at the PGA, seven and a half at the the U.S. Open. I think he's a little bit longer at the British, but still not I bettable. Even, I don't even think it's crazy because I've been. Like he's been pretty high in my power ratings for a while. He just he hadn't been finishing. Like he yeah. he had had he had these blow ups or not even blow ups, but bl- when you're that high, you know, doesn't take much. You shoot but, like one under when everyone else is shooting six under, like at yeah, and the players do, or something like that. And he he's I believe he's fourth in my power after the Masters. That he just eclipsed Rose in my list. Like <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about Rose on anymore. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, it's just he's been playing well and he's still playing well. So I, I think it'll be it'll be awesome. It'll be great for golf and these these younger golfers probably love it. But at the same time, they maybe they should start to fear it a little bit. Like if he's really gonna get back to, I mean, obviously he's not gonna get back to two thousand. He yeah, he's ever. he's not back to but, that, but he's like, good enough. It's still gonna be kind of cool though too, because like oh gosh, like you know. Best of all time. Now he's won a mate. He's won a Masters again. Like, oh shit! Like, did you, did we poke the bear by like being good buddies with them? And like, I don't know. It'll well, the, be cool. 
I mean, it, it's such a cool dynamic with the younger guys. You talk about Brooks and JT. Uh, I probably won't throw Spieth in there, but like Xander has been like, you know, surprisingly elite from guys yeah. that we don't typically name. Like you talk about Brooks and Justin Thomas, but Xander's been. I mean, he hasn't won majors like Brooks, but I mean, he's been just as good in every single big event um, from a general standpoint. But then you got like Phil, Kucher, Tiger, like all these got Furyk. Like you got, it's really interesting week to week with like the groupings. You know, have 40 year old guys competing and winning. Phil's on another level, social media and everything. And then you got all the young guys that are just gunning for it. That was such an amazing clip of him about. Cooch, I was dying. Like I, that was outstanding. Well done, Phil. Well done. What's That's funny is he only had one, uh, one take of that. I thought, I thought the same thing. So I was listening. He, he had a Instagram video he put on Twitter as well, talking about hitting, hitting nothing but long bombs at Augusta, and then yeah. uh, he wouldn't have any side action with Kucher because if he won, he'd only get point zero six percent of it. Um, That's amazing. But dude, he, he only. I mean, obviously he's driving in. He got one yeah. shot at it. It was perfect. Kudos, kudos, All Phil. It. Keep it coming. All right, well, let's. Um, I mean, everyone's talking about Tiger. We can transition now because uh, we got bigger fish to fry this week as far as the RBC Heritage. But before we do that, let me run through a couple uh, housekeeping notes. I forgot to, uh, and actually, you didn't really help me last week, man. I forgot to mention the Listener League on the podcast, so that did not fill. But we do have the Listener League posted for DraftKings. It's a three dollar entry. You can find the link in the description of the podcast or on YouTube. So go ahead and enter that. It's smaller than uh, it was a couple weeks ago, but just because it didn't fill last week. So hopefully you guys can fill it quick, and we can make it a little bit bigger uh, next week or the week after the Zerk. Um, congrats to a couple people. for uh, So one, we had a DraftKings contest, and we had a FanDuel contest for the Masters. Um, congrats to Papa Wolf on DraftKings. He won one of our wedges. He finished 266 in the Millie Maker. That was our highest winning uh, FGB bagger. Uh, and then Lumbar Bell on FanDuel won the uh, TaylorMade Spider Putter. He was the highest finisher on FanDuel in the $15. Luckily, we all got our $15 back because Tiger won. That's that's nice. Uh, and then one last special shout-out to uh, none other than my mother, who played for the first time on DraftKings, put in uh, two... Millie Maker lineups, got up to whatever position, was winning like $200. She said she was screaming and freaking out and dropped all the way down to fin- uh, winning 80 bucks. So she won a uh, double of her entry fees, but she was like, this is this is like so much fun. So <laughs> shout out to my wow. mom for, she thought she was going to win the Millie Maker. She had Molinari, Finau, um, Kucher, and I think uh, maybe Xander or somebody like that. So she had like first, second, third. Hell, she almost won a wedge. She almost won a wedge. She didn't. She did have the avatar up. I have to check where. Uh, maybe she won the second prize. That'd be um, outstanding. But yeah, she was. <laughs> oh, she was thrilled. So pretty cool. That's great. Yeah. Um, and then on the website, so I went ahead and wrote up an article. Um, this is the last thing I have, and I think you have something that you'll you can bring up during the during the players part of the show, but. Um, I did a little Millie Maker GPP storyboard article talking about like. Where do you guys come from to win the Millie Maker, and where do you guys that are leading early end up falling to? Um, we're going to try to track this throughout the year, but like basically our premise is there's so much, you know, victory laps on Thursday, tilting on Thursday, which some of it's like deservedly slow. I mean, deservedly, like Justin Rose sucks. You know, I'll be a little bit upset, but you don't have to be complaining that you're in 30th place on Thursday because there's so much golf to be played. So um, that's a completely free article. You can go read that. It talks about like, you know, <laughs> the average finishing position for the top 20, you know, was 26,000th place on Thursday. So like if you're in 26,000th place, you have a chance of winning the Millie Maker um, and vice versa. If you're in the top 50, you probably are going to finish like 15,000th. So <laughs> Um, keep that in mind as you uh, play in these big GPPs. Don't don't just shoot yourself out of it on Thursday. There's a lot of golf to go. Yeah, but it feels so fun to tilt. It's amazing. It does feel fun. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, I- I've talked to a few people. Like, on Thursday, man, uh, I'll don't be – Don't give up. Everyone checks lineups. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But you're never out of it. That's the crazy thing. Like, one guy was nearly – you know, in the the bottom twenty fifth percentile of the entire GPP, and ended up finishing like fifth this weekend. 
Like he ended up winning a or fifty thousand dollars, and he was probably winning nothing on Thursday. Like crazy. Yeah, so, I'm a big Thursday warrior guy, so I yeah. like to look on Thursday when it's green. <laughs> Screenshot it. <laughs> yeah, save them for my own personal. I, I never publish them, but yeah, I got a great wall of Thursday green screens. I try to do reverse psychology. Like if I'm doing really good, then I'll screenshot it to jinx myself into reverse jinxing it into finishing well. Because like obviously, if you're gonna screenshot on Thursday, you're not gonna do well. But if I do it as a joke, I assume well. Joke's on me because I ended up finishing second. Oh, yeah. Lots of lots of screenshots and then texting the buddies like, hold. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've gotten over the whole like, oh, don't jinx it. Just Oh, I don't believe in jinxes. It, I, it doesn't I, work I, anymore. I'm not out there hitting golf shots. Unless you're unless you're bare of that guy. He, he jinxes Kryptonite. people. <laughs> Anyone he's near, which he's, yeah. he lives in Florida, I believe. So I, I'm sure surprised does. I've done as well as I have on DraftKings. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, I always message him to find and then find out we're on the same guys. I'm like, oh, my weak shot. Thank you. Yeah. Keep that. Don't don't put that public that you're on that guy. Or you just have to withdraw. Yeah. All right, man. Let's um let's dive into some RBC heritage and uh, talk to some players for this week. It's actually a pretty strong field considering uh, you know, such an exciting event last week. I mean, this is actually pretty stacked through the uh, down to like the mid seven Ks. Yeah, it's a great field, and and I always love watching this tournament on TV too. So I'm pr- I'm pretty excited. And I'm glad they're, and I know some of it's because of sponsors. Like I know DJ probably wouldn't be here, but he is here, so it it really adds to it. And hopefully, I know it's tough after the Masters for a lot of guys to probably want to go play this. Like I think they could probably use like a bump in the schedule, which would would, would really help out. But uh, and it's a shorter course. A lot of the bombers probably don't. You know, like Rory isn't gain much from them here but uh it'd be really cool to see a deeper field but it's pretty good this year so i'm looking forward to it it's pretty good you 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 would think though maybe like the zurich like a two a two-man team event would be better right after the masters just as like a cool down spot like maybe a little bit more fun oh yeah flip this in the zurich it'd be golden right i would think that'd be a little bit better but i I don't run the pga tour well plus yeah right ever you're already in the carolina area so Pretty much, yeah. Know? Not too far away. Uh, all right, man. Let's dive into the golf course, and we'll talk through our names that we are uh, looking to play throughout the uh, DK pricing. So I'll start off with uh, the golf course. We're going to be playing at Harbor Town Golf Links. It'll be a par 71, just under 7,100 yards. Um, last year, this ranked the 19th most difficult on tour for scoring average, the 17th most difficult for birdie average. Um Looking through a couple of the key statistics, I think you're going to touch on the driving distance aspect. Obviously, this course is going to be a, a lot of less than drivers. It's more of position than bombing. There's 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 no bombing in this golf course. It's all about position. It's like very critical to be on the right side of the fairway. Um, so being as that is, this was the sixth hardest green and regulation number on the PGA Tour last year at 59%. Um, just such... I mean, there's a lot of things that go into that. The greens are smaller. The wind can pick up. That makes it difficult. But then, like, the the tree-lined fairways, you have to be positioned, you know, on a dog leg right to left. You have to be on the right side of the fairway to have an angle, a, a clear shot to the green. Um, and if you're too far right, then you're blocked out by trees. If you're not far enough, you know, through the dog leg, you're going to be blocked out by trees on the left. So it's a very interesting golf course from a tee shot perspective like i think the the golf course is played tee to green here um like tee shot to to get a position in the fairway that's why guys like luke donald have played really well here because they're so methodical getting off the tee into a certain spot um so like looking through putting here just the greens are so small it, it rated out pretty easy so like you can look at some uh some bermuda splits if that's your cup of tea but generally speaking, I think uh, most of our stuff will be aligned with strokes gained approach, green regulation numbers, not a lot with driving off the tee, stuff like that's not really uh, I'm looking at. Probably some shorter par four scoring could be included, but uh, I mean, it's a pretty traditional golf course and it's just guys that can uh, get it in play, in position off the tee. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you don't want to be awful off the tee, obviously, but again, it, this isn't Augusta. Like, feel free to look at that leaderboard and all the almost all the top ten. You're like, wow, that guy pounds it. Off yeah. the tee numbers are insane. 
And that, so this week I wrote an article, uh, I basically broke down the strokes gained data over the last six years at Harbor Town. It's, it's on the site if you want to read it more in depth, but essentially it, it did show the narrative that driving here doesn't matter nearly as much. Approach matters slightly more than the average week on tour. Uh, Around the green was about the same. And uh, obviously to do well each week, you know, if you, if you did, you, if you finished well, you probably putted well that week. So I kind of left that alone. I put the numbers out there, but it makes sense that guys who did better in X week putted better that week. Like that's, that makes a lot of sense, but I broke down the, so I looked at the top 10 percentile of finishes over the last six years per strokes gained on the field for that tournament. And I just took average percentages of what made up those total strokes gained. And it was 13% from off the tee, 33% from approach, 12% from around the green and 42% was made up from putting. So a large chunk of it was simply approach and putting, which will be there most weeks, but it was a little exaggerated this week compared to the average week. Yeah, putting will always, I think the putting rough number is like 40% of shots tend to come from putting, but... Uh, yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, approach is going to be key, but uh, I kind of... I personally, like when you talk about stroke skin approach and you talk about iron shots into the green... You're, you know, they're they're trying to position themselves near a pin. I think that plays into off the tee here as far as, like, approach is their mindset off the tee. Like, they're approaching a certain part of the fairway. They're not just hitting a, you know, a drive down, you know, 15 at Augusta. And they're just trying to pound it over the hill. They need to hit it to a certain spot. So I, I think strokes gain approach is huge this week. Um, and I think it applies to tee shots. So it, you're not just looking at, oh, I want stroke skin approach for green and regulation type of stuff. I think it applies to tee shots. So I think that'll be probably one of my heavy, heaviest weighted stats along with green and regulation. Um, probably won't look at scrambling. I think scrambling is probably pretty important here as it is every week, but it's just too noisy. I'm not going to rely on that for determining players or, or making decisions off players. Yeah, and like I said, you don't want to be awful off the tee here. Uh, um, I think Luke Donald has gotten away with it, but he's been absolutely nails on on his approach. But like of the top finishes ever here over the last six years, as far as the guys who have gained the most strokes, most I'd say close to eighty-five to ninety percent of them were still positive off the tee for the week. Now they weren't necessarily crushing it. Um, Kisner gained a lot when he went to the playoff with Furyk in 2015. But um, of the winners, I believe only Wes Bryan was negative off the tee for the week, and he was just brutal, but he gained over two strokes around approach. So, again, it, it just compared to the average week, you don't need to be gaining a stroke off the tee. Like, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be fine hitting it into the same spot everybody else is hitting it if your irons are on. So Yeah, exactly. Like, don't ignore DJ just because he gains a lot of strokes off the tee. He's also oh, yeah, very yeah, good yeah. on approach. So I, I just wanted to get that across in the article, too. Like, that doesn't mean fade, guys, but you you can bring a whole new slew of golfers into play this week. Yeah, I think I think the best way to put it is, you know, if, if DJ gains a bunch of strokes off the tee to this field, that's completely out the window because that's, that's essentially not even – applicable in this type of golf course yeah, so he, he loses that edge but he's not out of play yeah he gained a bunch on i think he led the field last year and off the tee i'm not looking at that at the moment but i know he gained a lot off the tee he just his short game sucked last year so yeah you gotta love dj in this type of field though but right 11 6 a bit rich um all right man let's let's dive into the field we'll uh we'll start in the 10k range and work ourselves down um i know i got some feedback from a few people wanting us to touch on FanDuel a bit more. So that's in the works. We're going to try to to talk through guys here at the Fantasy Golf Bag and see if we can try to get more dedicated content, I guess, for FanDuel, um, for those people that do play. It's, uh, it's, I wouldn't say it's vastly different, but yeah, the pricing and the, the lineup construction is pretty different on FanDuel than DraftKings. So 
keep that in mind and, uh, and stay tuned as we try to unveil what we're going to do with FanDuel. For sure. All right, man. Starting up in the 10K range, um, you got Dustin Johnson, 11-6 on down. We have Francesco Molinari, Xander Schauffele, Bryson DeChambeau, and Matt Kuchar at 10K even. A lot of familiar names from the Masters last week, and uh, I don't know personally. Obviously, we have limited data from the Masters. Apparently, Nelson's got all the data <laughs> that he was showing for his, his showdowns. Uh, hopefully he was crushing in those, but um, for the majority of people, they're not going to have a lot of, of data from the Masters, so you're trying to like pick apart key stats that uh, guys could carry forward. Um, obviously, Dustin Johnson had a great run. Francesco Molinari was in the lead for a majority of the event. Xander was up there. Um, going through this range, man, I, I'm really not interested in paying up for any of these guys. I Maybe Xander I'm most interested in playing. Um but I'll tell you what, I really, I think I'm going to go back to Kucher at 10K. He's had a decent run here over the years. My number one concern when going through like this top range, like, and, and again, I'm looking at the top range from a salary, not, not a salary saving standpoint, but like, what am I gaining for paying $1,600 more off of Kucher to DJ? I think I can get the same performance out of Kucher personally. Um, my only concern was he's played, this will be his fourth event, I think. Obviously, a major, um, the Houston, or no, it was the Valero and the WGC match play, which he made it to the finals. Um, it seems like a lot of golf, but he did this last year at the same time of year. He played five events in a row. His fifth event was a little bit suspect. He, I think he finished like 48th or something like that. But I think we can go back to him here. Fourth week out, good course history. Stats obviously look great. Um, he's one of my highest rated guys in our model for uh, the Guru's model. I like Kucher quite a bit, man, up top. I, I'm willing to play anybody up here. The, the question, I guess, will be again, I, I'm going to go in. I'll talk today because I don't really know anything about ownership, obviously, on a Monday night. So mm -hmm. I'll just talk through... Anybody up here, I think, if you're going to get a read on one of them not being owned, could be a great GPP play. Uh, personally, my favorite play up here is Xander. Um, I I don't normally take hard stances on guys up top. I I just love what I've, I've seen. I know there's the narratives out there about guys who finished well at the Masters, don't always finish well here. But I just can't get away from it. And I actually... I'll probably have one and done Xander this week too. I just I think the course sets up for him. His scramblings, his Achilles heel right now, but he's crushing it with the irons. He's good enough off the tee to get himself into position, and in a slightly weaker field, he's he's definitely my favorite up top. That's not to say I don't like DJ, I don't like Molinari, but you know I'll seven hundred dollar discount. I'll play Xander over over DJ and then. Kucher's the interesting one, like you said. Um, I can get behind it, but if people are gonna, if he's gonna be popular, I'll ignore it. The only one I'll play up here, no matter what their percentage is, is gonna be Xander, and then I may mix in. Say no one's gonna play Bryson this week. I I may mix him in if I'm making, uh, you know, twenty plus lineups and GPPs. Yeah, I mean, like, if if you're playing GPP, like, just say, like, a bunch of lineups in GPPs, like, really, I mean, you can make a case for every single one of these. The the one thing yeah, that stood sure. out to me when looking through this range of, like, what do you, like, you, you try to look at the field and, like, are you getting what you pay for? And for a 10K Kucher, I'm looking through his odds right now, he's 20 to 1. Xander and Bryson are sixteen to one. It's not that big of a difference. Dustin's the favor by a, by a long way, so so be it. And then Francesco's at fourteen to one. Like, just from a Vegas standpoint alone, you know, take out the recent form, the stats, the course history. That's that's not that big of a difference, you know, for a for a Molinari and Shoffley. So, um, I'm cool with I'm cool with Xander, like you said. But I think I think Kucher's the guy that I would love to start lineups with and it kind of proved true last week obviously a different event but like staying around 10k to start your lineups 
especially on this type of field, I, I, it'll keep me from having to dip into the 6Ks too much. I think that's uh, that could be important this week. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, 11, six, like DJ has to win to pay that off, which he very well could. He's he's still the best golfer in this field. But I think I can do a lot with the $700 savings down to Xander, who I think is the second best golfer in this field. And I actually bet him to at 18 to one, which is very rare for me to do. Like I said, I'm just very big on him this week. I think he should have been lower than 18 to one. And I, I hope it doesn't hurt. I just put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm cool with that. I think, I mean, if you're playing multiple sides, so I just kind of mentioned Fanduel briefly, and then we can get out of this 10K range. But like, DJ is priced at 12.4 on Fanduel, and like, if you if you're not familiar with Fanduel pricing, you could basically stack like three stars, three and a half, four stars, and like a couple mediocre scrubs. Like they're not even like scrubs really. So like, he would be if I wanted to really differentiate. Um, between the two sites, he'd probably be the play on on FanDuel, and then I would pay down on DraftKings. That'd be my personal approach. That's probably what I'll end up doing in GPPs over there, and then that gives me some freedom for my lineups on uh, on DraftKings. And hopefully, that just like gives me a position of being underweight there, overweight on Kucher, and I have a little bit of you know some outs if he does end up winning on FanDuel. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, man. Um, what are you looking at at the uh, in the nine k range? Really, kind of short pricing through the nine k and eight k, I guess. As far as not a ton of guys to pick through, but uh, who are you kind of eyeballing up there in nine k? In the nine k, and I'm sure he's going to garner a lot of ownership, but I really think Fleetwood is mispriced. I think he's the third best golfer in this field. So the fact that he's nine point two k seems outrageous to me. Maybe other people's models disagree, but um, Fleetwood's a guy I'm probably going to ignore the chalk on and just play him. I'm not going to try to get too cute with it. His his approach numbers aren't bad either. He's, he, he does very well off the tee as well, but he's 80th percentile in approach in this field. Um, he's very good around the green. 9.2K just seems insane. I'm not getting – and I'm also not ready to get back on Spieth yet. I know – he he showed pretty well after the first round last week, but I'm I'm not going to get excited off of one tournament, especially a tournament he's played very well at. He probably felt very comfortable. I mean, maybe it's, maybe it springs him back. I know he's finished well here too, but he will be someone I ignore. And um, I also like Webb. So for me, the 9K range, I think there are some very playable golfers here. Cantlay last week, he's played well here in the past too. But my two favorites are going to be uh, Fleetwood and Webb from the 9K. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll i just speak to uh, to Cantley real quick. I feel like he's like the obvious one most people will venture to, and he's not one I'm willing to play. Um, it seems like there's more downside than upside, personally. I, I just feel like it, it stands out that he's a good play. And strategically in GVPs, I would rather go underweight on that situation especially at 9,700. Um, I don't think he's a bad play, but it just seems like a one of those, it, it seems like one of those easy ones where, like we talked about pre-show, where's everyone going to look? I think he'll be the first one that people see in the 9K range for a number of reasons off of last week. So um, yeah. I'm with, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just, I, I agree. I just, again, Tommy's, Tommy reminds me of Ricky a lot in a sense that he just seems to garner ownership. And maybe I'm wrong. He wasn't very impressive last week. And I think he was semi-popular last week. So maybe maybe that drives some people away. But like you said, Cantley's not a bad play. I just think for my ratings, I have Fleetwood much higher. Not much. Higher. And at 9.2K, it's going to be hard for me to get away with from the ownership there for me. Like I think I'm just going to – that'll be my magnet in the 9K range. I'm just going to be – I'm going to be overweight on Fleetwood. So it'll be tough for me to get many others in this range. I'll let everybody else play Kisner and Siwoo. <laughs> I was even going to talk about them. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think this range will be pretty spread out, man. I think, uh, I, I don't think Fleetwood will get the majority of the ownership here. I think Webb will get a piece. Cantley will get a piece. And then Spieth always gets a little bit with 
you know, a little bit of form last week. He should get a little bit more maybe. But I think the whole 9K will be pretty spread out. So I don't think you can really get trapped on any particular one. I just, I know that when the pricing first came out, Cantley was the the guy that popped like, well, good recent form. Obviously off of last week in course history, looks good. Everyone will probably play him. So wanted to throw that out there. I'm with you. I'm with you totally on Fleetwood. I think Fleetwood's a very good play for this golf course, um, especially if the wind picks up, which I haven't looked at the the forecast. But I think he can you position did, his the iron. Forecast is kind of gnarly. Is it nasty? A, as a Monday, it looks like I'm not a meteorologist. I try not to do a ton with the weather, but it's definitely something you should keep an eye on. Friday looks like it could be a disaster for rain. So just be aware of that, everybody. Check the forecast on Wednesday afternoon. Right now, I think if there was anything to stack, it was going to be the p.m. a.m. maybe. But I guess it depends on what you'd rather dodge. Like, Because the a.m. guys on Friday might have to start in some shit. Like, the afternoon guys might not even go off if the forecast is correct. I mean, it, they're calling for a lot of rain. So just keep that in mind. Okay, noted. Um, so yeah, I, I'm with you on Fleetwood. I think he's a, a fantastic play and I don't have a number in mind as far as him being underpriced, but yeah, 9,200 is, I think more than fair. I think that calcs calculates into his course history, having none in his recent form being somewhat mediocre in his last couple showing. So, um, I like that quite a bit. I'll, I'll pretty much hang out in the low end. I mean, like I think Webb at 9,300 is, he should be close to, to priced up to where I think mean, he should be priced above Cantley. I think I think they're building in too much course history there. Um, so I like Webb quite a lot. And then uh, I I am not a Kisner guy. This will probably give uh, Jacob some some warm and fuzzies, I guess. But I, I'm okay playing Kisner on this track. I uh, 9100 is a bit rich, but I'm not really that afraid of it. He I mean puts he's got Bermuda the fine. Guy. The Pete Dye track record, he just won the match play there, too, on one. So, he's yeah. done well. I, I just feel like the the high end here, I'm, I'm kind of dead on. I, I'm i not afraid to play Spieth. I just I don't think my lineup construction, at least so far, the ones I've I've looked at building haven't led that way. But, like, Webb at 93, Fleetwood at 92, and Kisner, which isn't really in the same category besides the course, 9,100. Like, those are good prices, man. Like, I, I feel good about those saving that much salary off of where they should be priced in my opinion yeah and another tidbit on kisner too just again my data is just going back to 2013 but he has the highest total strokes gained of anybody in one tournament um he lost in the playoff i believe to furick that year they tied um but yeah he he's he's torn through this course before so yeah it, it this length doesn't inhibit him. Obviously, he had he actually came out pretty pretty well last week at Augusta, and then didn't do anything. But like he did everything with his putter. I think he led the field in putting um, per green regulation last week on Thursday, and then he just sputtered because he can't keep up. Man, that course. I mean, he's not short by any means, but for today's standard, he's short. So it's it's just tough for him. I like him. I like him on this type of track for sure. Um, all right, man. You ready to drop down to the 8K range? Yeah. All righty. So <laughs> looking through the 8K range, we got a few more guys to uh, to piece through, and I think they'll be similar to the high 9, 9K range. I guess they'll be pretty spread out as far as ownership. Um, <laughs> I think the majority of people will immediately look at Kokrak. And my my initial thoughts, so I'll just kind of bring this up now. We can we can discuss this because uh, Kokrak has been a guy that I have not been excited to play much over his hot run the past three months, four months. Um, on this track, with his back to back missed cuts, really good recent form, obviously. I think he'll come in lower owned than he has been the last couple events, and I'm okay playing him. I don't know if this is going to be a terrible, terrible wreck on my lineups as far as like mistiming this, but man, like if he had decent finishes the last two years, I feel like he would be a thousand dollars more expensive. But with the two missed cuts, good form coming in, I 
what what do you think on Koprak? I I feel like oh. I feel like the the form can trump the recent or the the course history miscuts. Oh, I already bet him at fifty to one. I'm I'm gonna ride the hot irons here. Okay. Uh, and he he gains well off the tee to begin with, so hopefully he can place it where he needs to. But and even through regression and everything else, I ran. He just he stood out as being especially on the Vegas odds underpriced. Um, I don't know if he's super underpriced with DraftKings at 8,800, but like you said, it's still higher with this type of field. There's enough big names up here that he could go overlooked with this hot streak, but no, I'm <laughs> scarily enough. I am on the Coke rack train this week. Yeah. He rates out number one for me. He's fourth in green regulation. Um, He's he's doing a lot with his irons, which I like. Obviously, this is going to be an iron course, so that's where I'm at. I I don't I just yeah, it's insane. I've been waiting for it to fall. It it really hasn't. And like I said, even when I've regressed him back to his mean and everything else, it just it, for where he's at. Um, yeah, another week of uh, playing Jason Kokrak, waiting for the wheels to fall off. I guess sounds phenomenal. Excited for this. This will be great uh, Thursday's tilt that we just talked about not doing. Um, oh, absolutely. Do we have any concern with any withdrawals for tomorrow by chance? I know we had a couple today. It wasn't anything noteworthy, but, you know, guys, whether for injury or whatever reason, backing out, alternates getting in. Um, the the name that stands out to me in the 8K range is, is Poulter at 8,600. But I'm just curious if, like, I, I was trying to look back at last year's uh, I feel like he would like this track, though. Like that's what I thought. I just I don't know. I, I, I don't know to, what goes through some of these guys' to heads. Speculate too much, but he's played this. I know he hasn't been in every Masters recently. Seven, I think he missed 2017. Yeah, but he played last year after the Masters and finished seventh. Uh, he played in 2016. He played in 2015, where he finished 18th. So. He's done it before. I I really have no reason to believe that he won't be out here trying to win. And he's another guy that I like a lot this week in this range. Uh, I wish the irons were a little bit better, but if it gets gusty, I mean, it seems like a great track for him. All right. Well, I'll just finish off my range with, with the last two guys. Um, so, obviously, <clears throat> I'm in on Kokrak. I guess you like him as well. Poulter, um, definitely going back to that, 8,600, same play with him last week as far as his, his form is just too good to pass up. Um, and he's got good course history here, surprisingly. Um, Brandon Grace is going to be a lock and load, 8,300, good recent form, good course history. He, he likes this place for whatever reason. Um, and then Sung JM, man, I... I don't know if I'll have a ton of exposure to him. He's always, I think he'll do better on a shorter track. He's just not that long, even though he did well in the web.com last year, but he always did well or really well on shorter tracks. I probably need to look into his longer irons a bit more to see how he does as far as, you know, getting those into position off the tee, but 8,400 Sung JM. We haven't seen him in a few weeks. He was in contention in, uh, the Corrales, I think. So I think Sung JM, 8,400. Brandon Grace, 8,300. Those two I mentioned just prior are the guys I'm I'm primarily looking at here. Yeah, Sung Jay is one of those guys who, and like I know Mayo has mentioned it a few times uh, throughout the beginning of this year, like targeting him for this course. And it, like you said, he's not that long off the tee, but it's amazing that he's he, he actually gains quite a bit of strokes off the tee. For so that leads you to believe that he's very accurate. Yeah, if he he's, is. If he's gaining strokes, but he's not that long, so so that's a positive. He, his his irons have been pretty stellar over his last twenty rounds. He's got a pretty solid short game. Yeah, I think I think there's a lot a lot to like with Sung Jay and the next guy I'm at in the 8k range not that I don't like race but I think Mark Leishman's another guy who's severely underpriced and he's coming in at 8k on the nose which um I don't know overall Leishman's one of those guys who I'd never seem to get right so be weary I guess but he never stands out statistically in anything it just 
seems like he has an overall solid game and he, he, he does. somehow man he somehow manages to always I don't know he, he, sh- he does he does better than the fields he's in for the most part but his irons have been decent he's 86 percentile in the field over his last 14 um, an average short game I just think I in my power ratings I have him much better than what he's priced compared to this field yeah um yeah he's 50 to one right now I he just hasn't played well here I he's not a guy he's has one top 30 finish finished ninth back in 2013 I see has missed cuts mixed in there 44th finishes 41st place finishes yeah it's not been pretty no and and you're totally right though like he's a guy he's hard to pinpoint like the course um what do you finish second to Aaron Wise last year in oh, Texas? Trinity Forest. Yeah, yeah, like that wasn't a course that like instead of kind of linksy like Australian type of course, but we were really focusing on different types of players, and he came out of nowhere. Like the the leaderboard and then him didn't look like it matched up. So I, I I'm not gonna play any Leishman. He, I mean, he you're, he you're correct. Like I've never. You're I guess correct on his played. talent. Yeah. It just I. I just, uh, I just he, I never get. I mean, because he finished third in Sony, he finished fourth tournament of champions. I don't know. Yeah, I think for me, it's just he hasn't. He has never really played well here consistently. And I, if he yeah, pops, I, he pops. I just he I doesn't seem like, like he lo- loves loves it. it. Yeah, I don't know. It it per my per the power ratings. Yeah, yeah. I just think he's so much better in that price that I don't know if I use him in cash. But I'm definitely going to be using him in my GPP lineups. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't use him cash. I would honestly. I mean, Ryan Moore's right above him, and I. I didn't mention him, but I don't mind him at all either. But I would probably play Ryan Moore over Leishman. I. I 100% would play Moore over Leishman personally. His irons have been better than Mark's. That's for, like I said, Mark never really stands out. In but he'll pop, man. Yeah, just. Ah. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm not saying he can't play well here. I'm just saying I'm not going to play him because the the he doesn't see I don't see enough with him now and the guys around him I don't feel like I'm giving up anything at least for what I see. Like if he was coming off of like a fifth place last week, like even then I would be skeptical, but there's just nothing for me to go off of for this for him here. And we skipped over uh, Benny Ann, who just lights out ball striking. I mean, his short game is not – actually, he's actually not bad on the green, but can't putt to save his life. I mean, he loses almost a stroke around putting. That's I know. insane. This is insane. And there's a but, certain part where we talk, we talk about regression with putting. When you're just a bad putter, there's no regression. I mean, even when even if he regresses to the mean, he's still bad. Like, yeah, I mean, he is still bad. Yeah, so I mean, it's kind of like Luke List. Like, he's better on Bermuda, but he still loses strokes on Bermuda. So, I mean, take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, he's one. I'm gonna check what his price is on Fanduel because he's one. I would, I would, I don't mind playing him, but he's not a guy that stands out. So he's 9800 on Fanduel, which is that's Benny Ann. Yeah, he's like he's mixed in there with a Billy Horschel and Charlie Hoffman. So. He's about the he same price. Last year, last year, he he putted well though. He's actually more expensive than Kokrak over there. Interesting. Or Kokrak's wow. cheaper if you want to Deep. say it that wow. way. Yeah, I don't really play much on Fanduel, so I apologize to everybody listening. It's just not a site that I play. Maybe I should. Wow. Good lord. Yeah, I I feel like the lineup construction is so much different. It gets tough if you're bouncing to the site for the first time, but if you kind of get comfortable i guess understanding how to build from the top um it seems like i wouldn't say there's a big edge or a bigger edge but it does seem like the the contests are like the competition softer interesting just because the lineups are i mean you could basically stack anybody you want i'll have to check it out 60k man, check, six people just know everybody i'll be i'll be the the noob on fanduel this week so feel free to scoop <laughs> all the tournaments i've been Will you be badgeless? Without a uh, no, I've done well in other sports. Uh, do they badge by sport over there? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Then I'll probably have a badge. Okay. I won't pick up your head to heads. Yeah, I'll, be, <laughs> I'll, I'll at least look like I know what I'm doing. That's good. 
They need to they need to update the badge system because now like if you just played like two contests, you get like three stripes in a V or whatever it is on the shield. I've on draft never games. paid attention to it. I just I've won a couple NHL GPPs. I play NHL on Fanduel, so I'm. I'm sure talking about DraftKings. I don't pay attention to their badge either. I, uh, <laughs> it feels like yeah, like you said. Well, how do you know to avoid Chipotle at it? I don't play. I don't play cash games. That's fine. Not to mention, I don't need to avoid Chipotle at it. <laughs> All right, man. Let's <laughs> let's move my, down. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's move down to your boy in the seven K range. I don't know if uh, uh, he's a decent price. He probably grades out similar to Leachman, I assume. Um, you gonna play some Harding? He does. I I pulled in his Euro numbers and he actually grades closer to Ryan Moore and Cam Smith for me than he does uh, Leishman. But coming off, it, it's interesting. It, I don't know. I'm not settled in on Harding yet. I know, I know Sky's going to play him and I'm pretty sure Sky already bet him at 80 or 90 to one, depending on the site you're at. Um, I mean, he, his ball striking has been pretty solid in his uh, Euro events it, it kind of sucks. He came stateside and he's played two of his three tournaments don't have laser tracking. So it's hard to say exactly what he was doing here because he was not that great at Valero. But I think, I think Justin Harding is, this is, is a pretty solid play this week. In my opinion, um, I actually prefer Cam Smith though, just same price, but I have Cam Smith rated just a little bit higher. Yeah. Cam, Cam's good, man. It, it's uh, it's a course that he's not good off the tee, so I can I can ignore. I, I wish he was a little better off the tee because he's been pretty bad off of it. But um, I think I think he may go overlooked for his talent as well. He's a very inconsistent golfer, which is the problem for him. But I mean, you're in GPPs, you're shooting for the moon, so I think you can get a winner here at, at 7,900. I'm not saying he's going to win. I'm, I would not shock me though, if he won. Yeah. I think he's just, I think he's just sporadic or cause he's not that short. No, it's, he, it's, it's, it's spring. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. He, he's 11th percentile in uh weighted driving accuracy compared to the field. So has some trouble keeping it in the short grass. Yeah. But I'll be playing him this week. I think I think he I think his ceiling is higher than what he's priced at. I can see that. Yeah, I'm cool with that. Um, <clears throat> I probably play a little bit of Harding. I'm not sure. I got burned by him the week at the Valero. He was not good. Him and Man Rocket both. Yeah, sucked. both. So obviously, I'm just gonna assume they were looking forward to their first Masters. I guess, man. I don't know. I mean, Harding, Harding's coming back to Augusta next year, no matter what. Got that T12. This does. I'll, I'll be honest though. Like, <clears throat> there's no metrics behind this, but I've talked about this prior. I, I was on the Mayo, on Mayo show a couple weeks ago talking about him, I think, and like, you can see these guys when they like you. You see the numbers, and that's fine. But like when you watch them play, you can tell. Like, do they great? Like, do they profile similarly to like how this course sets up? And he does seem like a guy that would just dink it off the tee, get it in position, and hit. It. Like he's not a bomber by any means. So I could see him. I could see him faring well in this golf course. We don't have a ton of history off of, so it's just like, you know, what what Justin Harding are you going to get? But he doesn't have to hit driver very much. I actually like from a profile standpoint. I don't think he's an awful play. No, and he's South African. You'd think. He- the wind, um, he'd be used to playing in that. I mean, he's won five times worldwide, I believe, in the last oh, yeah. year. He's hot for like, sure. The guy, he knows how to win. Um, I know he hasn't obviously taken high-profile tournaments, but this isn't exactly a high-profile tournament. So He's 80-1 to 1 right now. Um, all right, so we, we can move past them. I, I'll probably – I'm not sure about Cam Smith. Like Cam and, and Leishman right there are guys that I might – skip over we'll see but um yeah harding i'm good with uh lucas glover charlie hoffman lucas glover is always scary but 
I think his ball striking is, is not quite as good as Kokrak, but I do like where it's at. I'll be playing some Lucas Glover this week. He's he's had decent results here. He's missed the cut twice in the last six years, I think, seven years. Um, yeah, I think he's underpriced as well. He's slightly. Yeah, I mean. And yeah, not not outrageous, uh, but for how he's been playing, I mean, he's been a T, if he's not missing the cut, he's been a T20 machine. Yeah. So I, I like him from that same standpoint of just hitting it. I mean, he's a good iron player. So, yeah, Glover, Glover and Cam Smith are probably my two favorite in the <laughs> upper 7K range. Okay. Well, I'll uh, I'll play some Lucas Glover. I'll play some Harding. And, um, I mean, that, that whole range right there is kind of tough. But to me, hey, man, I'm leaning Charlie Hoffman again. This is his third week playing in a row. Um, obviously, we were all high on him for the Masters. Played good at Valero, which he had, had had success at. I think at this golf course, um, he's had some decent results way back when. I, I have no problem going back to Charlie Alvin. It's third third event in a row, good finish last week. He should have some momentum and feel good about his game. So yeah, seventy eight hundred for Charlie Hoffman. I'm I'm fine with. I mean, really anyone in that range is doesn't look bad. Like you would you would almost. I wouldn't say you'd have to talk me off of him, but like. You know, Russell Knox, Luke List, I'm never really on. Like, the T3 last year doesn't really, like, stand out to me as, like, a go play him this year this type of finish. But, like, Russell Knox has been steady. He's been a world-class player for the last year, winning over on the European Tour a couple times, finishing well over here. So, like, that top range there is actually really bunched up for me. Oh, yeah, I, I think it's – you could plug and play here for filling out a lineup for sure. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's just tough because I try to take some stances. So I, I think I think the stance for me here would be I think Glover is the biggest steal in this range, and then I'll, I'm going to roll the dice on, on Cam Smith's upside though. But like you said, I I wouldn't I don't know I wouldn't laugh at anybody who said they're going to play Knox or uh, my man Bedelli. Don't worry, I, I got it this week, but <laughs> um, Good. I, will, I will not be playing badly, though. <laughs> but I, I think Hoffman, Smith, Harding, yeah, there's some choices to be made. I think Glover's my favorite, though, which is scary. Yeah, I just I'll just kind of halfway rank them just so people don't think I just like everybody here, but I, I think it's a really good range right there. Um, but oh, it I, is. I would, lean, I would lean Glover, Hoffman, Harding, and Knox for me, so those would be my four. Yeah, for sure. Just so that we're clear, I don't want to. I don't want people thinking. Yeah, you can make you... a case for a lot of guys. Like, I mean, like I said, I wouldn't shame anybody. I, yeah, but I think my favorite two, like I said, Glover, Glover Smith, and then um, Rafa Cabrera Bayo seems underpriced at seven six. I know we didn't quite yeah, get hit... that low yet. Yeah, let's get down that low. Yeah, tell me, tell me what you like there. I'm gonna be loading up on Rafa. Like that, just he is. He just is a much better golfer than what what that price is is saying he is. Um, I know it's probably due to due to the recent form. He's only played here once and he missed the cut, but finished 36th in the Masters, uh, 30th at Valspar, um, missed cut at Players, third at Arnold Palmer. Like he hasn't had anything ridiculously high this year, but he's still been. Still been performing pretty well. He doesn't play too many what I would deem weak events over on the PGA Tour. So you have to take that into consideration with his finishes, I think. But 7.6K, he's going to garner a lot of ownership for me in this range because I don't really I don't really care for too many others right down here. Yeah, um, I'm fine with Cabrera Bio. I He's not like... I, I again, I think he's underpriced for that range. Like I would probably take him in a two ball over a lot of these guys. Um, yeah, and that's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah, when you just start comparing one to one, it it, it kind of makes a lot of sense there. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the one guy you can look to there. So you know, there, there's a couple, I guess. That, like you look at Abraham Answer and how he's played with his irons. Like he's notoriously good, even though his last event was 
uh, act completely awful with his irons. But assuming he can clean that up a little bit, this should be a course for him that he can scrape it around pretty well with his irons. He doesn't have to make a ton of putts. Yeah. Answer just – he caught my eye. He, just get, he does more of his gaining off the tee. So I guess – when I was trying to make stands again, I think that's what got me off him. But he has been, like, I do like him as a player. Just, I don't know. He gains some off the tee, but he gains on approach as well. Yeah, he hasn't like, been brutal with the irons. It just, um, I think he's 84th percentile off the tee and 66th approach over his last 10. So that'd be 18 total rounds, but... I do like him as a golfer. He, he he was definitely a toss-up. I think if Rafa was a higher price, I probably would have fallen on answer. Yeah, I, I don't know how he's done on on these tracks, but I, I, I think answer's sneaky down here, man. Like, I, I can't I like really count on Cabrera, or not Cabrera, but I can't really count on Graham. Um, no, he gained a lot of his strokes in that um, in the off-week event. Yeah, uh, Putacana, I think. Yeah, so that's pretty much it for me, man. I, I think like we'll just say mid to high. That'd be the last guy. I, we'll say RCB is fine, but like I think Abraham Answer. He, he pro- honestly, I, I got a feeling he's got to be somewhat popular because he was so popular at Valero for for various reasons. I gotta imagine he'd be somewhat popular here. I could be wrong on ownership, but yeah. Could be wrong. I don't I'm know. I'm not the best guessing of it unless it's obvious, but yeah. All right. I think, so, I think people will play Ollie this week. Uh, I've heard. I've, uh, I, I think Jeff Feinberg was already one. I mean, he's going to bet him, not necessarily. Yeah, but he's an Ollie guy. Like, I, yeah. So, I, just, I will not be. I'll put it that way. <laughs> that's fine. Um, all that's right. So, let's go down a little bit further. Yeah. Um, I mean, Corey Connors is leading the field in approach over his last 11 laser rounds, um, 7,300. That, uh, I don't know if I can do it, though. I don't know how you feel about riding Connors' hot streak. I mean, how I feel. So, like it's, like, uh. <laughs> it's, it kind of sucks with some data because, like, you look at his finishes here, he's got two missed cuts. Uh, 2015 and 2018, but you could argue he's a different player now. Obviously, the win and then playing well at the Masters. So, um, yeah, he's he's not. I probably wouldn't talk anyone off of him. I, I would definitely not talk anyone off of him. I think like keeping the hot streak going is is certainly in the realm of possibilities. But I'm looking below that to Bud Collie. I just Corey Connors wasn't in my isn't on my list. Um, but I, I wouldn't talk anyone away from him. Yeah, Bud doesn't. I don't know. I see. I skipped Bud even. I went right down to uh, Eddie Pepperell as my. He'll probably be my main play from this lower seven K range. I got a couple guys because like looking looking down the bottom range, like Bud Colley's more of an Alabama boy, but um, like with Henley right there, like those are guys Bermuda, Georgia. I'm cool with hitting those type of players. So like. Um, Bud Colley, I like quite a lot, 7,300. And then the last one down there was, uh, Russell Henley at 7,300. I think he has winning upside. Um, and he, he's one that just kind of pops. Like he's had a couple good finishes recently. Um, I mean, not, not good, but like relatively speaking, made cuts and, and finished the weekend. Okay. But those are the two that I, that stood out to me up here or down here. The rest of these guys, man, I, they have a lot of warts. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, my two highest rated are are Matt Wallace and Eddie. And um, I know Wallace, he that really hurt last week. I had a decent amount, which may have been, in hindsight, a mistake. It was his first year at Augusta. I, I did think he was capable of making the cut, but it was that was not pretty. Um, but I'm not necessarily afraid to come back to him again. Another guy who I just know can win, and like I said, just he's the highest rated for me down here, so I'll probably sprinkle him and and same with Eddie. I just think he rates out well. It's not necessarily anything overly statistical driving me to them. I just think they're some of the better golfers in in this range. I think that's the only way to look at it, right? 
I mean, yeah, I, like because the approach for Eddie again, it's only twelve laser rounds. He he's played more on the Euro Tour, so I don't I didn't carry all of that over yet into into these stats. But uh, as far as the power ratings go, which is kind of what I lean on when it starts getting down here, is uh, for me it's it's Wallace and Eddie, and I, I bet Pepperell at a hundred to one as well. Okay, um... he's. A- guy so it, this course could be better for him than especially than last week geez i i don't mind either it's just we don't have a ton of data on them as far as like playing on this side of the pond that's well if you don't follow euro you probably don't i mean you probably know eddie maybe from twitter he is uh quite the follow if you don't but um yeah maybe maybe i mean they're both good players i have no problem with that good, yeah and maybe you can get two good golfers down here that at less ownership because people don't know who they are. Maybe they're going to fall for Luke Donald's course history and play him. I hope they do. I hope they enjoy. Do yeah. <laughs> no Luke like, Donald for me. No. I mean, See. at some point you have to wait how a guy's playing over his course history. I, <laughs> yeah. There, it's yeah. We'll bring up course history, but you can't just blindly play it. No, thanks. I mean, it, and they'll look at his, his finish at the Vals bar. That doesn't count either. Like, I, I would not weigh exactly what he did around the greens he there. He really missed every other cut except there. So yeah. And he did everything around the greens there. He chipped and in from the bunker. Maybe like last week he, with speed. Sure, he's he's going to be comfortable here. I'm not saying he can't make a cut, but there's quite literally zero reason for me to play him. There are just so many better golfers. I can't rely on his past just that much. Yeah. I'm with you. I would not. Do not advise. <laughs> All right, we'll hop down into the uh, six K range. There's really no one else. I mean, there's there's a few guys in here that again, it's a it's it ugly down here. It gets thin, so like you can make a case for a couple of these guys. Um, you know, one guy I did peek at was Streelman, which he's on my list right now. I haven't pulled the trigger on playing him or not, but he had a good showing at the Valero, I think, and he he's played well here at this golf course. So he could be one of those guys that's getting into form, and if you have a you know a 10% stake in Streelman, you could be like double the field or, or at least overweight a little bit. So I, I'm not against that, but the rest of these guys, man, it's just like you're, you're essentially playing for a turnaround of some kind. Like they haven't been playing good. So you're just waiting for them to bounce back. Yeah. I don't like the, that. No, the, the only ones who, and I may have to play, I may play these three guys and just, just a handful combined, like not all, I won't play all of them in five lineups each, but if I want to play some more Xander, um, I don't mind Kevin Na. I don't mind Scott Piercy. And I don't mind Michael Thompson. Now these guys, like you said, they're all, (laughs) they're all kind of on the regression train here, heading back to the golfers. They normally are, but, uh, if I was going to dip down here, say I wanted to really try to cram Xander, Fleetwood, and I don't know, maybe another 8K guy in a lineup, you're going to have to play somebody from down here. Uh, those are the three that I'd be looking at just based off of um, how they rate out as far as the fields they've been beating. I mean, it's it's nothing more than that. It, it's complete roll of the dice. I have no real confidence in any of them, which is why I'll spread them out instead of just playing one of them. But... Um, I think I like Piercy the most, which is weird, but <laughs> yeah, I, I <laughs> tend to like Piercy. He's just been, his irons yeah. have been so bad. Oh, it's been bad. I, he's definitely falling into the golfer he normally is right now. So yeah. that's scary. Yeah, but... I'm not gonna play any Piercy. If he goes off and plays good, then so be it. But I just I can't do that. <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about most of them down here. Like I said, if if I needed to stretch, I mean, everybody's fall swing lover. I mean, Cam Champs down here sitting at no 6,500. I mean, whew, what a fall from grace. Wow. Yeah. But there's really no one down here, yeah, that really does anything for me. Like I said, I might have Piercy in one or two. I might have Kevin Na in one or two. And for me, that's it. I don't know where you're looking, but it's ugly. Yeah, the only one that I was eyeballing down here, um, I see Shane Lowry. I didn't even look at him, but 
the at the very very bottom range um dj trahan 6300 he he burned a lot of people at the uh was it the valero i think maybe he missed the cut i had him at valero yeah so i had a i had a bunch of them there as well um but I, i don't mind going to the back to the well i mean he was playing so good prior to that this course Maybe not doesn't set up great for him because he is typically longer off the tee. But sixty three hundred, you can do a lot with your lineups and GPPs. So he'll be in my player pool for sure. Um, one above him, Denny McCarthy is another guy that's kind of in that same boat. And, and strictly speaking, like these aren't like strong plays, but guys, I don't feel bad about building out my sixth guy with as in a GPP like. If you yeah. if you feel strongly about stacking a you know a nine k and a ten k guy together, you probably need to get a little bit weird with a six k a low six k guy. So those are a couple guys that just stand out to me that I think have a chance to to play well and, and make the cut. So outside of that, yeah, guys, I agree. It's 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 really thin down here. I mean, I think. Because some like, do it with uh, their putters, like that's that's my thing. And, and there's some guys like Stewart was a guy I looked at. He's a little bit higher up at 6,700, I think. And like he's he's looked like he's done well, but he's gaining like six strokes putting. And I I just can't I can't plug a guy in for doing that. No, and although he's been sustaining it decently enough, like it's the same thing with uh, with Wyndham Clark. He was doing a lot of it on the greens, and it was like okay, well how much how much longer can you continue yeah. this but i mean i don't know maybe but that's the noise one like i said so it's hard I, if i'm gonna take it down here i'm probably gonna try to look at um the irons as much as possible which which means you probably shouldn't play piercy i don't know it's just weird he just rates out uh two lineups that's all two lineups <laughs> yeah it's just there's really nobody I'm 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 literally trying to find a guy in the mid range just that looks decent because I like when I first looked through here I was just going to avoid the I mean, six K range. Approach numbers actually aren't that bad now that I'm looking. Who? Um, Brian Stewart. No, his I mean, his approach over- numbers are okay, but like he's not finishing that highly with decent approach numbers and putting. I don't I don't really love that. Oh but, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's no one. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a guy I'll probably play. I can't even guess. <laughs> Hang on, I'm gonna pull up. There's there's two like right next to each other. Let's I see mean, here. Danny Willett's irons haven't been awful. No, That's no, no, no. Surprise. No. Yeah, I got two for you, man. Actually, kind of interesting. Yeah, his, his iron play doesn't look great, but it's really not that bad. Um, Who's that? So I got two for you. One, Rory Sabatini, 6,400. He actually hmm. has played this event um, every single year except for 2017. Two missed cuts, two top tens, and finished 23rd and 17th outside of that. Really played decent. I mean, for a good stretch of time last year, uh, his irons look a, like don't look solid right now. But again, this is a position golf course. I don't, I don't hate it. And then Ernie Els just below him is another guy that's kind of been not popping for upside, but he's been making a lot of cuts. Yeah, honestly, I didn't even realize he was in this field. That's the thing. Like, I just I stopped at the sixty six hundred and up, and like. There's guys I don't even know who they are. That with no PGA Tour stats, obviously I I, I can't go off of much. But uh, yeah, below that man, low seven or the low six Ks. There's actually some decent, like uh, relatively decent for six K. Scott Brown, oh man. Actually, Scott Brown is somebody who I brought up. Um, he grades out well, T to green. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, I brought him up when I was running some, some simulations and he kind of stuck out and I'd actually kind of forgot about him until you mentioned him. But, uh, yeah, it's Scott Brown. It's really not that bad of a punt from way down here. Yeah. That's probably the best term for, for the people I just mentioned punts. 
Oh yeah, just complete. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hail mary down here. I mean, what, like which you is, said, I mean, you're, which is good you're though. Going for gold. Yeah, you're going for gold. Like, but but yeah, I mean, you don't want this to be like a DJ Trahan from Valero where he's thirty percent owned and sixty four hundred dollars. Like the, none of these guys are going to be, you know, twelve percent or higher. There's no. No, I, I'd say a large majority of people will be building lineups like seventy four hundred to ninety seven hundred area. Yep. Which yeah. is, I guess it's most weeks. It's not me going out on a limb here, but, like, yeah. There's a lot of names down here that are just ugly with this type of field. Yep. So, tread carefully. But, yeah, man, we'll uh, we'll quit stumbling over the guys that probably won't win anybody any money. Absolutely. <laughs> it will get you out of here. Uh, any final thoughts for you? No, I'm, I'm just really looking forward to it. Uh I'll get some matchups out there for anybody who's looking to uh, do a little more more on the, the gambling side. The card will be out tomorrow night. Uh, Sky and I will convene to finish that up. Like I said, hopefully hopefully we can find some value in some head-to-head matchups. But as far as DraftKings goes, uh, I don't know. I, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I like this event every year, and I like the top end here. So I'm kind of curious on how my own builds will will come out. But uh, I have a feeling there will be a lot of Fleetwood in them. I like it. Can't argue with that, man. All right. My only final thoughts are get into the Listener League. You can find the link in the description of the video or the podcast, video on YouTube, podcast on podcasts. Um, (laughs) Go ahead and leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. If you haven't already, that always helps us out. Check out the website at fantasygolfbag.com for all the tools that uh, Axis had mentioned in our articles for the week, talking through our plays. Um, And that'll pretty much do it, guys. We hope you have a fun week. We will be back with the Twitch live stream on Wednesday night. Forgot to mention that earlier. We did not do it last week due to the Masters. But uh, we'll be back 9 p.m. Eastern, twitch.tv slash redkachik. We'll see you there Wednesday night, guys. Good luck with your lineups and research. We'll see you later.